President Trump unfiltered from Singapore to the White House. He is, as ever, combative. I'm Robert Costa. How the Trump doctrine is rattling international order in an FBI report quickly becomes a political flashpoint tonight on Washington Week. We haven't given up anything. I think the meeting was every bit as good for the United States as it was for North Korea. After a history-making handshake and signed agreement, President Trump declares North Korea is no longer a nuclear threat. But some in his own party remain skeptical. This is the beginning, I think, of a long, uh, long process. There are bipartisan concerns about the president's decision to suspend joint military exercises with South Korea. I think exercises are important. I'd like to see them continue. Mr. Trump is now looking to host a similar one-on-one -on -one summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Plus, the Justice Department Inspector General delivers its report about the FBI's investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails. And President Trump's former campaign chairman is headed to jail. We discuss it all with Mark Landler of The New York Times, Ann Guerin of The Washington Post, Susan Glasser of The New Yorker, and Jeff Zeleny of CNN. This is Washington Week. Once again, from Washington, moderator Robert Costa. Good evening. The long history of American diplomacy has featured many turbulent chapters, but longstanding U.S. allies have rarely faced such blunt challenges over trade as they did at the G7 meeting in recent days. And U.S. presidents have rarely directly engaged dictators like North Korea's Kim Jong-un, as President Trump did this week in Singapore. During the landmark meeting, both sides discussed North Korea's nuclear weapons program and security assurances for Kim Jong-un, but they did not address human rights concerns about the Kim regime, North Korea's ballistic missiles, or the missile defense system the U.S. helped install in South Korea. The signed joint statement calling for a nuclear-free North Korean peninsula is non-binding and lacks a timeline or any concrete commitments from North Korea about how it would dismantle its nuclear arsenal or terms for verification. Speaking Friday, President Trump said, We now have a very good relationship with North Korea. When I came into this job, it looked like war, not because of me, but because if you remember the sit-down with Barack Obama, I think he will admit this, he said the biggest problem that the United States has, and by far the most dangerous problem, and he said to me that we've ever had because of nuclear, is North Korea. Now, that was shortly before I entered office. I have solved that problem. Mark, when you think about the handshake, it was a historic moment, but there's also the meaning of the handshake in terms of policy, and the president's put war games and removing them from the South Korean area off on the table now with the North Korean leader. What does that mean for the region, for China, that may want to see the U.S. have a smaller footprint? Well, the war games, and that's the term President Trump used, and it's in itself a loaded term because it's really, these are joint military exercises. The North Koreans often refer to them as war games to give them a more kind of provocative, uh, aggressive uh, sort of nature. But by putting them on the table, the message I think he's sending is that the alliance between the U.S. and South Korea uh, is in play to a certain extent. He's willing to make a concession on something the South Koreans view as a real centerpiece of the U.S.-South Korean alliance. And it's not just a South Korean issue. The Japanese will look at this and say, how committed is the U.S. to Japan and its alliance in the long run? President Trump has also talked about it in the long run withdrawing American troops from the Korean Peninsula. So all of these things that our allies in East Asia took for granted for decades are now in play as a result of this diplomatic overture. What are some other concessions that could be on the table? Well, to continue on on Mark's theme, this is also something that China has ha, has wanted. Ch China's uh, diplomatic play on North Korea f for some time, which the U.S. used to reject out of hand, was what they called a freeze for freeze. The U.S. would no longer hold what China considers to be provocative uh, exercises in its backyard and waters that China wants to consider uh, it as, as part of, of its, you know, we, we call it international uh, waters and say that the uh, Chinese are overstepping. They say we're overstepping, uh, that, that we would no longer do those exercises uh, in, in exchange for uh, a freeze on, on the Chinese 
part on sanctions. And so essentially what Trump did was to give the Chinese the part that they have been seeking from us in, in stopping uh, these exercises, which is not to say that that isn't a, a, a prelude to potential uh, concessions from North Korea, but we don't know that part yet. What we know is that he offered to give up something that the Chinese uh, and, and the North Koreans have been wanting him to give up for a while. Where was South Korea at this summit? Well, not there, but certainly played a huge role uh, in making it happen. In fact, without President Moon Jae-in of South Korea, this summit would not have happened. Mm -hmm. What I was struck by sitting in Singapore was how quick it came together. Three months and three days after the president first walked into the briefing room on March 8th and said, I have an announcement coming up uh, tonight. Stay tuned. I'm like, what's it on, Mr. President? I just happened to be in the briefing room. And he said, you know, uh, the, uh, he's accepting this invitation. So that was an invitation that South Korea brought. So South Korea was central to this, but they were not at the summit and, in fact, were surprised and caught off guard by the fact that these joint military exercises were called off. And as Mark said, I think something was extraordinary this week. I do not think the White House anticipated talking to people afterward that a joint headline was going to be, you know, the president travels to Singapore and makes a concession, you know, that is going to anger the Pentagon, cause concern of Republicans on Capitol Hill. They did nothing to pave the way for uh, calling off these joint exercises. It seemed to me it was a last minute thing. And using the word war games, I'm not sure the president knew that he was using uh, Pyongyang. Yang's a language, but he certainly was. You said anger the Pentagon, but Susan, is that true? Is there a divide in this administration? Secretary Mattis at the Pentagon has been somewhat quiet in this whole process. It's been really Secretary of State Pompeo who's out front. Well, so Secretary of State Pompeo has taken the lead in preparing the summit and, and working with President Trump. Uh, according to some of the reporting, no easy task uh, when it comes to pulling off this summit in this short amount of time. Secretary Mattis, however, made an extraordinary and I think almost overlooked speech today uh, at the Naval War College. He made some tough comments about Russia, which seemed very out of step with uh, President Trump's more favorable view of Vladimir Putin. But interestingly, he also made a comment about North Korea and this deal. And he said, it's a possible path toward peace now with North Korea. Now, that is a wildly different characterization of the outcomes of this summit than the president's grandiose words that, that we already saw tonight in this program saying that he solved the nuclear issue once and for all. Now, there's, there's nothing whatsoever to suggest in the actual outcome of the summit or this very short, very vaguely worded four bullet point communique that they issued as a, uh, at the end of the summit. There's nothing in there that says the nuclear pro program is resolved. There's, uh, it's much more vaguely worded than previous commitments that North Korea has agreed to in negotiations with the United States and other countries, uh, previous commitments that, of course, North Korea has actually reneged on in the past. So, uh, you know, again, there's this enormous gap between the president's uh, outsized claims for what he's achieved in the North Korea summit, and there is this, this huge rift within his own government. In any other administration, we would be talking about that as the big story. But didn't Kim commit to denuclearization, or is it more complicated than that? Kim committed in principle to denuclearizing, but North Korea is committed to doing that several times in the past, as far back as 1992. I think it's 12. Yeah. And that, that's right. So it's it's a, this is a common thing. The North Koreans have put this on the table, and they've and, never defined exactly. And they what never it defined is. it. And so the timetable for doing it, how you verify it. Um, and the modalities of how you do it are all basically the substance of what negotiations are ab about. That's what the Clinton administration spent years negotiating, and it's what the Bush administration also spent years negotiating unsuccessfully in both cases. So a vague kind of aspiration to denuclearizing gets you basically to the starting line. It doesn't get you any further than that. And the criticism is President Trump extracted that in return for all the prestige and validation and legitimation that he gave to Kim by doing What does that prestige well, mean for well, Kim back in North Korea where his power is always under threat? What, what does it mean when he sees these, these videos provided by the administration about hotels in Pyongyang? It means everything. And I think the flattery we've seen on previous um, um, examples of the president traveling around the world, uh, other world leaders have flattered him. The president was flattering Kim Jong-un. He's half his age, 34 years old, the president, as we know, turned 72 this week, calling him a, you know, a terrific negotiator, a master a strong negotiator, <laughs> strong man. And I was so 
struck by all that. But one thing, we were all briefed by the Secretary of State in uh, Singapore, um, and uh, um, Secretary Pompeo said repeatedly, verified, verified, verified. That word was not in the statement at all. So I think the cleanup now and the details here obviously are going to be left to the, the Secretary of State. The president's doing his own thing. When you think about... Well, he's talking about it, but the Secretary of, of State is going to be left to actually uh, do it, and, uh, you know, it's a much harder task. But the president keeps building his own world order, his no, own new doctrine. You think about... Uh, Susan reported today that he's looking to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin after saying he would like to see Russia join the G8. Well, that's right. So first of all, obviously, we all know that President Trump has this long-standing fascination with Vladimir Putin. He's consistently the only person uh, who uh, President Trump has not criticized uh, on the world stage, aside from that one minor tweet after the, the Syrian chemical weapons incident. Uh, Trump has had it in his head, as I reported you know, this morning, ever since March, when uh, the famous do not congratulate phone call. Uh, uh, after President Putin won re-election, and of course, President Trump did congratulate him, and he also invited him to the Oval Office. Nobody really took that seriously, I think, because they thought, that's insane, right? In the, the politics of this, in the middle of the special counsel investigation, with all the questions about uh, Trump and Russia, why would he do this? And yet, in fact, uh, they have been negotiating over this. It looks like it, it's possible as soon as in July, President Trump and President Putin could meet. Yeah, they could attach it to the uh, NATO meeting. Uh, but, I mean, actually, Trump answered that question today. Yeah. He uh, he said that that talking to Putin, including Putin in, in things like the G7, formerly the G8, he'd like to make it the G8 again, is the same as talking to North Korea. That And it, and it, gave, it gave a window into what, Trump's version of diplomacy is, and the Trump world order, which is very personal, very direct. He thinks he can make a difference by having a personal relationship uh, with, with dictators, with leaders, whoever they may be, and he is willing to set aside any number of concerns that the United States raises in other, in other forums in order to have that personal relationship because he thinks he can get business done. And that's exactly what he said he wanted and to do. let's not forget the G7, right. which was yeah. only a week ago. While attacking our yeah. allies. Attacking yeah. allies on trade. Wait. He's taking on longtime U.S. allies. Now, he says it's a transactional relationship that matters, the economic relationship that matters. But this is so different from the history of U.S. foreign policy, which has so often been about values. Well, you're right about that. But the, the point I'd make to build on what Ann said is not only does Trump see the upside in foreign policy in talking to our adversaries, he sees our allies almost exclusively in terms of downside. Our allies are free riders, freeloaders. They have locked us into deals that are against our advantage. And I think that if, if one were to start to define a Trump worldview, it's to really shred the existing alliances and look for kind of a new form of relationships well, the, around the, the world. The NATO meeting's coming up soon. Should we expect him to make some moves on, on that front? I mean, in Brussels it is. It's in about uh, four weeks or so. Uh, Sure, and I think some of these relationships, I mean, we've seen them go, everything seems so dramatic. I mean, we had Emmanuel uh, Macron here, you know, and they were best friends. And then at the G7, that was blown up. But tonight, I noticed, shortly before we're going on the air, he tweeted again, blaming all of the coverage from the G7 on the fake news media, said, you know, there was no uh, problem there at all. Well, that's simply not true. So I'm not exactly sure why he's doing that, but it's clearly a couple days after he r reads a lot of news coverage and he's had time to watch a lot of commentary, he's uh, obsessed and also often changes his view by what he hears or sees. So I think he is actually a little bit worried about those fraught relations. Well, it's not just the newspapers that he's that are piling up in the Oval Office that he's reading. It's Republican comments right. about his his position on trade. Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee, Republican, said this week that the GOP's become cultish in how it's fallen along the president on trade. Well, that's right. And he he said that you know his fellow Republican senators were afraid to poke the bear. Uh, and to poke President Trump. There's some evidence to suggest that that's true uh, when it comes to the politics of it here. But I think, actually, that's part of why Trump maybe has misread his allies in attacking them so hard. Uh, I don't think he realized, A, they're not, they don't play politics the way that he does, and they actually think that the rhetoric of the President of the United States matters in a way that Trump, I think, is not used to being taken literally, number one. Number two, I think Trump may not really fully understand that the politics uh, in other countries, in Canada, in Germany, uh, in France, and in, in many of the countries in East Asia as well, uh, 
President Trump is wildly unpopular there. There is an enormous political imperative, actually, to these fellow allies and world leaders to stand up to Donald Trump. Uh, these countries don't like Donald Trump to smack around their leaders, to insult uh, the prime minister of Canada when he's hosting uh, a major global summit. The politics are good for Justin Trudeau to say, you know, in a polite Canadian way, like, you know, screw you, Mr. President. And I, I think that Trump hasn't fully thought through what does it mean to be America alone. That's the word I keep hearing from allies and people in Europe when I've traveled there recently. And, and he's, these are not isolated issues, trade, North Korea. Final thought for this, and is that you have the president going after China on trade, 50 billion in new tariffs as he's negotiating with North Korea. Right. I mean, it, it, absolutely simultaneously, the it, Trump administration is asking China to, to really kind of go on a limb here and continue enforcing sanctions uh, against North Korea and, and presumably prod North Korea along to uh, make the deal that is outlined in, in that page and a half uh, uh, agreement to keep talking. And at the same time, he's slapping, you know, uh, up to 50 billion uh, tariffs on up to $50 billion worth of, of goods with immediate retaliation by China. It's kind of, it, it, yes, they're, they're two different tracks, but they are happening so close together, it, and, and they simply can't be separated politically, and they certainly can't be separated, you know, if, by Xi Jinping. I mean, and he's going to see Trump both things. Has, right. has yeah. made an explicit connection between the two. He said at the summit, mm -hmm. part of the reason that China may not be as cooperative on sanctions is because he's been tough on them on trade. So he's actually put these two things on the same track, and that makes it very complicated for him going forward on North Korea and trade. Exactly right. Talking about blurred lines, let's turn to the Russia probe. Today, a federal judge ordered former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort to be jailed ahead of his trial. Special counsel Robert Mueller accused the 69-year-old Manafort and a Russian associate of contacting potential witnesses and asking them to lie to the jury. Manafort is facing a number of federal charges, including money laundering, illegal lobbying, conspiracy, and tax evasion. President Trump was asked about Manafort today. Manafort has nothing to do with our campaign. You know, Paul Manafort worked for me for a very short period of time. He worked for Ronald Reagan. He worked for Bob Dole. He worked for John McCain, or his firm did. He worked for many other Republicans. He worked for me, what, for 49 days or something? A very short period of time. He worked, he was the campaign chairman, uh, and we, we know that. We had to fact check that. But more importantly, if you look at this Manafort trial, now that he's going into jail, will he break? Will he cooperate like so many others have with Mueller? That's the central question here. And that, I mean, as the president has said so much about the special counsel's investigation. Bob Mueller has been keeping his head down, doing his work in the uh, a courtroom. But what he did today is majorly significant. I would not have said up to this point that Manafort would uh, break or cooperate. And he may not. But boy, this certainly raises the stakes on all of that. But I think just a bit of perspective. Yes, it was 49 days. But Bob, as you know, uh, Without Paul Manafort, Donald Trump likely would not have become the nominee or would not have been as smooth of a ride at the convention. Paul Manafort was in charge of those delegates. He had a smooth uh, fight there. But this is an example of the president met all day on Thursday or most of the day with his lawyers, talked to them a lot throughout the day. It's one of the reasons I think he is sort of unplugged a little bit and talking about all of this. We saw him out on the uh, North Lawn of the White House uh, this morning, you know, answering all these questions, trying to get his point of view and seizing on that IG report, saying he's implicated or he's, um, you know, he's exonerated. But the Manafort thing, we have to keep an eye on that. Uh, this is as, uh, as serious as it's been, and we don't know if he'll flip or not. And the president, uh, president's chief lawyer, Rudy Giuliani today, dangled the idea of pardons, not directly to Manafort, but dangled the idea uh, in a series of interviews. Yeah, well, that's kind of been the, the implication, the unspoken thing that's hung in the air all along. The president him, himself is, is widely thought of. You know, some of the other pardons he, he's made, even in unrelated cases in recent weeks, have been seen as kind of setting a precedent in place for him to dangle pardons that are for people that are directly involved in this. So that's the next sort of twist to, to watch in this whole Mueller story. And Susan, we've got to make sure we turn to the other big news this week, because the Justice Department released a sweeping report about the FBI's investigation into Hillary Clinton's private emails. The inspector general found former FBI director James Comey made mistakes and should not have bypassed his boss, then Attorney General Loretta Lynch, and how he made announcements about the Clinton investigation. The IG report concluded that while Comey 
broke with protocol. The FBI was not motivated by political bias. Yet there the president was today saying he was exonerated. These are separate investigations. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, and, I, you know, that uh, in a... In a remarkable uh, appearance before the press this, this morning on a variety of topics. Probably the president's mischaracterization of this inspector general's report was, was one of the most consequential, right, uh, in, in directly saying that it exonerates him from something it doesn't even relate to, number one. Number two, I, I've never ceased to marvel uh, at the, the ability of the president and his defenders to, to flip around the subject when it comes to uh, FBI Director James Comey and the 2016 election. They're making uh, an institutional argument. Not, not only that, but you have to say, uh, to the extent that Comey uh, intervened in the election, it was pretty clearly on behalf of uh, Donald Trump and not on behalf of Hillary Clinton. And, you know, it, it's almost this inversion of reality any time the president talks about it that is, that is fascinating, number one. But, you know, but the, the right Giuliani came out after the report, used it as a pretext to say that the president should now fire the special counsel, Robert Mueller, who is not the subject of this report he is not. in any way. And this whole, everything in Washington these days seems to be about perception because you look at some of these text messages from the FBI agents saying, we'll end it, talking about the Trump campaign. Republicans have seized on that, and they say, and the FBI IG said that wasn't appropriate conduct. Yeah, I mean, well, there's something in in the report for everyone, uh, and 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 Trump is seizing on a, a part that, and Republicans uh, uh, in Congress are also seizing on, uh, on on parts that that support his narrative. The president is also distorting the narrative uh, considerably, as, as as Susan laid out. But there, it, I mean, the report not only says that, that individual agents uh, behave badly, but uh, does deliver a reprimand uh, uh, to Comey that, that he rejects. And the overarching conclusion of the report is that the FBI institutionally did not act out of, out of bias. And if you add all of those things up together, it comes out that every single thing the FBI did and Comey did uh, had the effect, whether intentional or not, of, of hurting Hillary Clinton and, and helping Donald Trump. But it, it does bring up all these questions about credibility of the Justice Department. Different investigations, but a lot of this is about the public war, not necessarily the details of everything. And the president has done a very skilled job, actually, in, in mixing all of this up and certainly raising, um, you know, serious issues about the um, investigation here. But... Uh, the reality is Bob Mueller is going to do his own thing here. Uh, we'll see what happens going down. But the president has a decision to make. Is he going to sit down with him or not? That's coming. That's up. for next week. Will he sit for an interview or not? Well, TBD. Our conversation, meanwhile, will continue on the Washington Week Extra. We'll, we will discuss Attorney General Jeff Sessions and his decision to separate undocumented migrant children from their parents. You can find that later tonight at pbs.org slash Washington Week. And we want to send best wishes to longtime cameraman Charlie Vogt, who will be retiring soon. It's been great working with you. And to all the dads out there, happy Father's Day. I'm Robert Costa. Have a wonderful weekend.